Pastor Mike is on a vacation, a much-deserved vacation for two weeks. So if I do really bad today, just say two weeks and Pastor Mike will be back, okay? So today I want to start with a feeling I think all of us know. It's the feeling when we want to get some words of affirmation or we want to hear a good job. Like for me, when I was younger and I played in a soccer match and I did really well that match, I loved to hear from my teammates that I did a good job. But there was nothing like getting off the field and going to my dad and hearing, you did a job well done. And it's this feeling of affirmation that in a sense gave me the motivation to keep going on. And I think many of us in our own lives know this feeling of words that make us feel good. It's like we go seeking after words that make us feel right about ourselves. And we've been in this sermon series titled Seeker. And I think one thing that many of us go seeking after is words that make us feel good. Words that feel right. Now, gentlemen, I'm going to attack us first and get us out the way, all right? When it's a new year, we start exercising. And not only do we exercise, we exercise two weeks in a row. We did two whole weeks of exercise. How do we come home? We're not coming home slouched over. We're like, yo. It makes your voice deeper when you work out. Yo, what's good? Oh, you want the time? Hold on, let me check. What time is it? Oh, let me tie my shoelaces real quick. We worked out for two weeks, and now we're walking around like we're the strongest thing ever. And a lot of times when people are walking around like this, always flexing, what are they looking for? Words of affirmation. We're looking for words to make us feel good about ourselves. And you know, some of you ladies were laughing. Big mistake. You shouldn't have laughed. Because at least we worked out for two weeks in a row. Ladies will do two workouts, head on to Amazon, uh, waist trainer, uh, order. Get a new waist trainer, strap that bad boy on, and work around. Oh, girl, did you lose weight? Yeah, no, she didn't. No, you did not. You lying in church. You lose one thing when you put on a waist trainer. That is the ability to breathe properly. It's squeezing the breath out of you. But in all honesty, guys and girls, we all know the feeling of wanting words to make us feel good about ourselves. Whether you did your hair differently or you finished a project, it's nice to feel those words of affirmation. And because they feel nice, it's often something that we would go seeking for. And I've had the privilege here at the church of working with your well-mannered, mild, obedient children over in the kids' church. And in the children's church especially, I learned very quickly that kids love words of affirmation. Now, when I'm doing the kids' camp, there's two words that I can never utter unless I want to be swarmed by children. And those are the words, good job. So follow me here. I go to the kids' camp, and it's the end of the second week, so I'm tired. So a little girl comes over, Mr. Josh, look at this rock that I found. And I'm not trying to be swarmed by kids right now. So I lean over, I do a quick 360 degree scan, make sure there's no kids within 200 miles, and I whisper, wow, good job. I go to blink, I open my eyes, now what? A hundred kids, I can hop on one leg, look at me, I can spin in a circle. Now every kid wants to hear words of affirmation because you told one kid, good job. We see in the office after work when there's all the kids there, the second I say good job, now one kid's doing a split, now one kid's running around. Everybody wants those words of affirmation because they feel good. And I think in 2020, it's even easier to get words of affirmation or clicks of affirmation, likes of affirmation on Instagram. Because in working with the teens, it's not as simple as just posting a picture. There's a science to it. There is layers of editing and filters, and you can't just post a picture anytime. 
You have to Google the right time to post to get the most amount of likes. In other words, there's a degree in Instagramology that all of your students have. There's a way to get the most amount of likes, and in a sense, what is happening? They're getting words of affirmation in the form of likes. And I don't care who you are, it feels pretty good to be affirmed. It feels pretty good to get those words of affirmation, to feel good about yourself. And because it feels good, it is often something that we go seeking after. It feels good, so we seek after it. And this mentality of seeking after words to make us feel good isn't just at the end of a soccer game when you played well. It's not just on the playground for kids. It's not just when you lose weights for the adults. It's not just on social media for the teens. This idea of I want to hear words that would only make me feel good about our, myself has slipped into the church as well. This idea that I just want to hear a message that's going to make me feel good about myself. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. And as we're doing this series called Seeker, it was born out of this idea, what is a seeker-sensitive church? And in the church world, a seeker-sensitive church can often be accompanied by the idea that you would never say something on a Sunday that would offend somebody. You would never say a message that would make somebody feel bad about themselves. And please understand me today, there is absolutely nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself. There is nothing wrong with a message that makes you feel good. But there is something wrong with a message that tells you that you're okay without Jesus. There is something wrong with a message that doesn't encourage you to grow and to change. At Family Church, we 100% love you just the way that you are. But we love you way too much to see you stay there for the rest of your life. There's levels of growth, and there's always a next step for us to get to. I don't care if you're preaching the sermon, if you're on the worship team, or if it's your first time at church. There is always another step that we can be taking in our walk with God. And as I began to think about this mentality of seeking words to make you feel good about yourself, I quickly realized that this is not something that is new in 2020. But there's a story in the Bible of a young man who was going to Jesus seeking just that. Words to make him feel good about himself. He wasn't thinking about changing his life. He had no intentions of growing. He wanted to go to Jesus to hear that he was doing a good job and keep it moving. And this guy's name is the rich young ruler. He's known as the rich young ruler in the Bible. And he's seeking words to make him feel good. Let's read this story. In Mark 10, verse 17, it says this, that as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and he fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He then says, you know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And I almost picture the rich young ruler like, oof, I did it. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And then in verse 21, the passage shifts. And then it says, Jesus looked at him and he what? He loved him. Jesus looked at this young man and he loved him. And through the lens of love, here's what Jesus says. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Then come, follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth and great possessions. So this man, this rich young ruler, goes to Jesus 
seeking words of affirmation. He goes to Jesus seeking words to make him feel good about himself. And in seeking words to feel good about himself, Jesus, through the lens of love, offends this young man. In this passage, in loving him with those words, he's now offended. Think about it. The rich young ruler knows he's doing pretty good, so he's going to get that pat on the head. And he goes to Jesus, and it says that he knelt in front of him. And I picture he kneels in front of Jesus with his good works and his new waist trainer on and his self-righteousness and says, Jesus, I'm doing good, right? Look at me. I can hop on one foot. And in all of this, Jesus, through the lens of love, he looks at him and he says, you lacked one thing. So sell all that you have and come follow me. And at these words, he becomes sad. And the funny thing is the young man asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, ooh, that would have been bad. (laughs) And Jesus responds by giving him the opportunity to position himself next to the only person that could give him eternal life. He says, how can I get eternal life? And Jesus tells him to come follow me. It's kind of like last week when Pastor Mike was talking about the prodigal son. And he talked about how the prodigal son was always safe. He was always eternally safe based on his position as a son. And it's almost like in this passage... Jesus is giving him an opportunity to position himself next to him, to position himself as a spiritual son. He says, you want eternal life? Come and follow me. And because he was seeking words of affirmation only, and only to hear that he was doing things the right way, he hears the exact opposite of what he wants to hear. Now think about this passage for a second. We don't know this young man's name. He is known as the rich, young ruler. His identity here is found in his wealth, the rich, young ruler. And the very thing that this man values the most is the very thing that Jesus asks him for. Isn't it funny how God will often ask us for the things we want to hold on the most? How we'll tell God, God, you can have all of this. You can have this and this and this and this and this. You can have all these things, God. But this one thing right here, this is mine. This is hands off. And it's like God comes into the convenience store of your life. And you say, God, look at all the options. Whatever you want, take all these. It's all yours. And then God has to go, yo, what you got in the back? And what do you do? Man, God, come on. Stop playing, man. You play too much. Look, all these, take it. Here, actually, here's a coupon. Just get out my store. It's yours. Take it. Go ahead. You are good. And God says, nah, what's that thing in the back? And what's funny about God is when you take that thing that you had in the back and you hand it to him, he gives it back to you greater than you ever could have gotten it on your own. This is the God that we serve. It's that one thing that we don't want him to have. And in the case of the rich young ruler, it was his wealth. And in going to God, because this man went to Jesus, Jesus didn't come to him. He goes to God, asks a question, doesn't like the answer, and now he's met by words he doesn't want to hear. And hearing words you don't want to hear is often offensive. And this might sound crazy to hear in church, but this is the nature of the gospel message. The gospel of Jesus is an offensive message. Summed up, it says, you're not good enough on your own. It says, none of us are good enough on our own. We are all equally in need of God. And this can sound offensive. 
And when Jesus walked the earth, he offended many people with this message of God's grace. He offended many people with the message of his kingdom. And it might sound weird that Jesus would offend anybody because many times we have this picture of Jesus in our mind of a weak, soft-spoken man who would never cause any ruckus. We have this picture of a very quiet, submissive man who drank his tea with his pinky up because he was very nice. He was just a nice guy. Maybe you've seen that picture, that painting of Jesus when he's holding a lamb. And he's like petting it as if Jesus was walking around with a lamb and petting it like it was a dog in a stroller like we see at the mall. And I think many of us are very well acquainted with Jesus the lamb. We understand the idea that Jesus was the lamb of God, but many times we also forget that the Bible also calls him the lion of the tribe of Judah. Because there is a duality to Jesus. He wasn't just somebody who knew how to be a lamb. He also knew when the time was to be a lion. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus flips tables where people are selling stuff. Imagine you're selling Girl Scout cookies in front of church and somebody comes up and flips your table. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, that's the lion of Judah. He had such a passion for God's house that when they were making it about things other than God, he said, this cannot go on. And the lion came out in that moment. And we see with Jesus, yes, he was submissive to his father, but he was also superior. Yes, he would go to the side and pray by himself, but he was also very powerful. And quite honestly, Jesus was superior because he was submissive. It was in submitting to his father that he found his power. He was often powerful because of the time he spent in prayer by himself. Jesus was not a weak man. He was a meek man, M-E-E-K. They are two completely different things. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the word meek isn't the way that we define meek. In English, the word meek means this, quiet, gentle, easily manipulated, submissive. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, blessed are the manipulated, for they shall inherit the earth. It's the Greek word praus, P-R-A-U-S. And this Greek word praus translates this way. It says, blessed are they that are powerful yet submit their power to an authority. It translates to strength under control. This word praus would be used to describe a war horse. A huge, powerful horse able to do damage but yet submitted to the authority of the rider. In other words, Jesus is saying, blessed are they who are dangerous and yet submit to God. Blessed are they who can do damage and yet submit it to God. Blessed are those who can move a room but wait on God to tell them when to move. He's saying you're submitting that power to an authority. And this was Jesus. He was the perfect image of one who was meek. Think about it. He was the most powerful human to ever walk the earth. And yet he was crucified by his own creation. If I was the most powerful human and you told me that my forehead was big, you're dead. You're dead. I'm not playing that game. You cut me off. Oh, don't worry about it, brother. Bye. Dead. Snatched up in the spirit that quick. You're done. And Jesus, the most powerful human that ever existed, was willing to go to the cross because he was under the authority of his father. And he was always about his father's business. And this strong Jesus, this lion of Judah is what somebody had to quickly meet in the story of the rich young ruler. Because Jesus would say things that would offend. And this rich young ruler walks up looking for the Lamb of God. 
and there's a lion standing right there in front of him. And he says to this lion, good teacher, good teacher, almost as if he's calling him good, now will you be good to me? It's like someone who gives a compliment, not because they want to give a compliment, but because they want you to compliment them. It's like when you put on new shoes, you compliment everybody's shoes, so they look at, oh, I like your new shoes. Get a new shirt, same thing, I like your shirt. Oh, yeah, I just got this. He says, good teacher. And Jesus looks back at him. This man who's seeking affirmation. He's seeking words to make him feel good about himself. And what I love about Jesus is he's not too concerned with what we think we want. But he's very much concerned with what he knows we need. I'm going to say that again. Jesus is not too concerned with what we think we want. But he is very concerned with what he knows that we need because something, sometimes they're not the same thing. We have to remember that God is a good father. And parents, think about it. If you gave your kids only what they thought they needed, what would your kids look like? They'd be crazy. We're having ice cream for dinner every night. We're not going to school today. We're not doing no virtual learning. I want to watch some TV shows. I want to watch some Netflix. And yes, we might want the Netflix, but God knows what we need, and he's going to give us what we need. And this rich young ruler, he's seeking words of affirmation. And instead of giving him the affirmation, Jesus hands him a revelation. In that moment when this young man is looking for words to feel good, Jesus says, there's one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and come follow me. Because all of the things that the rich young ruler might have been great. Holding up those commandments, his good works was great. But you can have a lot of things and still be lacking the most important thing. And Jesus tells him, forget about the rest. Forget about who you were as a rich young ruler. Become my follower. And it's these words that this young man needed. They were spoke through the lens of of love. And guess what? Love is funny because sometimes love hurts. What? That's right. Sometimes love hurts. And in this situation, love hurt this rich young ruler. Proverbs 27 6 says this Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. What? A wound over a kiss? Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. What does that mean? It means that sometimes somebody who really loves you will tell you something about yourself that you don't want to hear. It means that a good friend might have those awkward conversations. Like, yo, what you said back there, that wasn't cool. The way you treated that person, that wasn't cool. Even though it might be uncomfortable, it's better to be surrounded by people who actually love you. So much love for you that they would hurt you than somebody who talks about you behind your back but will kiss you on your face. And that's what this scripture is saying right here. And in this situation, Jesus lives this out perfectly. Where he loves this man in a way where it wounds him like a good friend would. And in this situation, love causes this rich young ruler to stumble. Whoa, Jesus, get rid of all my riches and follow you. Jesus, I built this Fortune 500 company from the ground up. You weren't there with me working 80-hour weeks. You weren't there with me when I was crying. You don't know the work that I put into this business. And now you're going to tell me to sell all that I have and to follow you? Yes, that can make even the strongest person stumble. And the funny thing about Jesus is that the idea of following Jesus is often a stumbling block to those who don't believe in him. It is Jesus specifically who is the stumbling block. It is Jesus specifically where people go, whoa, hold on. Let's think about it. You watching TV, and there's phrases that you can and can't say. 
the phrase, God loves you, that's fine. Nobody has a problem with that. The phrase, God cares about you, that's fine. He does care about me. The phrase, God sees you right where you're at, that's fine. I love that. But then say this, Jesus Christ is the only way. Whoa, hold on. We didn't agree to say all that stuff. Why is that? Is it possible that it's because Jesus is the stumbling block, the same way the Bible says that he is? And we see this in 1 Peter chapter 2. This passage is talking about the honor that comes with following Jesus. And then it talks about the person, what, who Jesus is to the person not yet following him. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this. So the honor is for you who believe in Jesus. And then it says, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Wait, you mean sweet lamb of God, Jesus can be a rock of offense? Yes, that is exactly what this passage is saying. And I can understand why somebody like the rich young ruler, who seems to be a pretty good guy, would be offended at the words that Jesus spoke. I mean, even in my own life, I would be offended by that. Now, I'm going to talk as if I'm apart from God for a while. But me apart from God, like, honestly, I was still a pretty good guy growing up. I would listen to my teachers. I would listen to my parents only when they were right, which was a small portion of the time. <laughs> I, would, uh, I wouldn't bully anybody. I would share my school lunch. Like, I was a pretty good person, and I, I need some help. But Pastor Brian, come here. I need, you, I need your help. You're going to be me. This is my birthday twin. We share a birthday, so he's going to be me. Yeah. This is me. All right. This side of the stage is bad. This side of the stage is good. So good to bad. In my own strength, I'm still a pretty good guy. In my own strength, I'd smile. I was a likable person. I had no reason to be thought of as a bad person. And as I was going throughout my history classes in high school, I learned about a lot of bad people. Like there was this guy named Joseph Stalin in Soviet Russia who killed over 40 million people. Like that is nothing near me. I need someone to be the worst person. Valerie. Perfect. Valerie's going to represent the worst person who ever lived. Now take that man from history class and combine him with all the evil people from history class. And then take that person and combine them with your coworker who lives their life to annoy you. They wake up every day like, let's get him. Another day, another opportunity to get on their nerves. Take all the worst parts of humanity and put them right here. And this is me, good Josh, and this is them. I'm not going to say bad Valerie, but bad Valerie. So there's this huge gap between me and Valerie, the worst ever you can imagine. And this is fine. And it makes sense. I didn't kill all those people. I didn't abuse anybody. I would never try to hurt feelings on my own. And this mindset of myself apart from Jesus is fine until we work in the stumbling block. Because Christ is the stumbling block, and let me show you how. On the scale of bad to good, I'm fine, but where would I land if we factored Jesus into the equation? Come on, Rayvon. If we factor God's goodness into this equation, God's goodness is going to be all the way on the end of the stage. Now you tell me, in my own strength apart from Jesus, in my own self apart from God, am I closer to the worst person we could ever imagine or God? Who am I closer to? The worst you could ever think of. The absolute worst person. Am I closer to them or am I closer to God? What? You mean me? Yes, you. Now, there's two issues with this presentation I just made. 
One, on this, there's an edge to God's goodness. There is no limit to God's goodness. Trying to ask the question, how good is God, is like asking, what number can you count up to? It goes on and on and on. And the second mistake that I made in this presentation is that apart from God, I made myself any better than the worst person to ever exist. The reality is, and yes, if you've never been offended in church, here's your chance. The reality is, you are no better than that person you cannot stand if you're not living in God's grace. It's the truth. And that's myself included. That apart from God's grace, I cannot look at myself as better than others. I cannot try to look backwards and judge. Because if I would just turn around, look how good God is in comparison to who I am. Thank you, guys. You can sit down. <laughs> Even without God, we can try to make ourselves seem to be something that's good. Seem to be something that's better than those who are around me. Reality, we're all in need of help. Reality is we're all in need of a savior. Reality is we all have those bad days where we wish we just had a friend. No matter how good you may think you are, apart from God's grace and apart from God's goodness, none of us could ever be good enough. And this is what Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler. All right, you did all those good things. You have your wealth. But there's still one thing that you lack. Come and follow me. In Romans 3.23 makes this idea abundantly clear. That on our own, we're not good enough. That on our own, we can never be strong enough to get to that side of the stage. In Romans 3.23 it says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, apart from God, we're all tied for last place. There's no levels to I'm better than you. Yeah, I did some things, but I'm not as bad as them. No. We're all equally in need of help. And the thing that I love about God is that God realized that we would never be able to do it on our own. So what God does in an act of humility, or should I say in an act of meekness, he steps down from eternity and he enters into humanity. And Jesus, the creator of the heavens and the earth, decides to get relegated to the position of a baby where he would grow. And Jesus, from he was a baby up to his death, walked the earth and lived the perfect life that none of us could live. He lived for us the perfect life that would be required to make it to that side of the stage. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just live the life that none of us could live. He also died the death that all of us deserved. Of his own free choice, he decided to be crucified by his own creation. He decided to die the death that every single person in this room deserved. He decided to die the death of one tied for last place. And not only did he live the life he couldn't live and die the death that we all deserved, he died. And then three days went by. And after three days, he did something that humanity has never seen. He rose again. And in the Bible, it says, in the book of Galatians chapter 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. He literally died for us, but he also rose for us. He rose with all authority. 
He rose with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And then he did something wild. He gave you the key. The key of all power. You mean I can walk the earth as you did, Jesus? Yes. He gave us the authority to walk as he walked. And he's not asking for us to live perfect lives. He's not asking us to live mistake free. He's asking us something very simple, but something very hard. He's saying, come follow me. He's saying, that life that you had before, sell it all. And I'm not talking about your business or your job. I'm talking about those things that we want to hold on to. He's saying, forget about all of that and come follow me. Because there's so much greater in store for you if you would just trust me with your life. There's so much greater in store for you if you would just follow me. And that's my one point today. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. For the rich young ruler, following Jesus looked like selling all that he had and physically following him. I want to ask you today, what would it look like if you decided to follow Jesus? In other words, what's that one thing you keep in the back room? Where God, this is mine to have. God, this is for me. You can have the rest, but this is for me. And in this story, the one thing that was held in the back room was his great riches and his great wealth. God, you can have everything except for this. And the funny thing about humanity is there's a lot of different things we'll hold on to. God, you can have my wealth, but my depression, I'm holding on to that. That's mine. God, you can have everything. This needle is mine. I want to hold on to this because it makes me feel better. God, you can have everything, but my pride, that's mine. God, you can have everything. My business, that's mine. God, take whatever you want, but I'm holding on to this because it costs too much for me to give it up. And that's what distracted the rich young ruler. He said, Jesus, you can have everything, but giving up my wealth, that would cost me too much. But if he would have opened the eyes of his heart, he would have seen that he was standing next to the one that would pay the ultimate price for him. That would pay the highest price. And today I want to encourage you, if there's something that God is asking you to give over to him, it's not because he's mad at you. It's not because he doesn't want you to be happy. He's doing it because there is so much more in store for you. He's doing it because there is so much more in store. He says to the rich young ruler, you want riches? You don't even know riches. Heaven, you're not even close with your riches. You want riches? I can give that to you. But what you lack still is me. And there is no substitute for Jesus. Sometimes when you're cooking something and you run out of butter, you can search online, butter substitute. All right, throw in two tablespoons of olive oil. And we can live life where there's many substitutes. But there's one thing that you cannot substitute in this life, and that is the stumbling block named Jesus. There is no other way. There is no shortcut for that. There is no way to the Father except by the name Jesus. Of Jesus and maybe you're sitting here today and you're like I heard that 20 years ago I just wasted 20 years I've been holding on to this thing for 40 years well here's what I want to tell you today that the story of the rich young ruler it ended where I left off he had to write the rest of his story I wonder if he walked away sad and disappointed and he went back to work and he looked around and he quickly realized that he had nothing in comparison to the man that was standing in front of him. I wonder if we'll get to heaven and we'll get to meet a guy like, what's your name, man? I'm Jake. Oh, what's up? Nice to meet you. The rich young ruler. Oh, I heard about you. 
Oh, you came to Jesus. And in all of our lives, maybe you feel like you've missed it up until this point. I want you to know that the story of your life, the pen for that story is still in your hand. Keep writing. Keep writing. You're not stuck in your past. Because in those pages where you messed up in your book, there's this thing called grace. And this grace is like a huge pen of whiteout that can cover your mistakes. Erase your mistakes and give you fresh pages to write on. You can be 95 today. There's still time to write your story. And maybe you came to church today and you were like the rich young ruler. You came with your good deeds, your new waist trainer on, and you were just looking for a pat on the head. You're looking to hear, I'm doing good, but I'm still going to hold on to this one thing. Here's reality. No, you're not. No, you're not. We all need help. We all need help. And maybe you're feeling offended at this message. That's the nature of God's goodness. It's not going to conform to what we think it should be. It's going to be what God knows it to be. It's not going to be the version of God we think we need. It's going to be the eternal God that we know that we need. And today I want to tell you that if you're focused on this side of the stage, that wasn't the focus of the message. This message was not to tell you how bad you are. This message is a testament of God's goodness. This message shows you just how God, how good God is to us. And what I love about God is he gave us a grace sandwich. That Bible verse that I read in Romans chapter 3, it was stuck in a grace sandwich. Because we read the part where it said, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. But listen to what's on either side of that verse. In verse 22 it says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, in other words, equal playing field. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then watch verse 24. And all are justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Redemption that came by the stumbling block. Redemption that came by the Lion of Judah. Redemption that came by the Lamb of God. It's great that we all are living our lives. And if our life was a house, it's like we're building it up and up and up as time goes on. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, it talks about a cornerstone. And what a cornerstone was, was it was a strong rock that you would use to build a house around. It was a strong rock that would be the strong point of that establishment. And the same rock that may have been a stumbling block over the years, if we would open up our hearts and open up our eyes to see who that rock is in Jesus, that same rock that we stumbled over can now become the cornerstone that we build our lives upon and all we have to do is freely accept him as it says in verse 24 that all are justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus and if you want to accept Jesus today here we pray a prayer and we all pray together and what this prayer is saying is it saying that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. In a sense, you're going from Christ being a stumbling block to Christ now being the cornerstone of your life. And we all pray together and it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and you rose again for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. 
to change me and to make me new. I will serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want to quickly ask if there's anybody here in the room that prayed that for the first time or maybe somebody online prayed that for the first time. If you're here and that's you, can you wave at me real quick so we can celebrate you? Is there anybody at all today that prayed that? Right there in the back, welcome home. I want to say welcome home, and we would love to connect with you. So if you would stop at, your welcome, at our welcome center and let them know that you gave your life to Christ, we'd love, you to get, we'd love to give you a book to get you started. And if you prayed that online for the first time today, type JESUS in all capital letters. We'd love to connect with you that way as well. This has one more reminder before you get your week started. This message was not about how bad you are. It was all about God's goodness, and I want to encourage you to follow Jesus this week. Let's pray before we leave. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to hear a word. I pray, Father, as we're going throughout our week, that if there's something that we are holding on to, I pray, God, that we would fully surrender it to you. I thank you, Lord, that we're blessed this week that your angels would watch over us and protect us. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your offering, you can drop it on the way out. We'll see you next week.